Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Reverse Engineering Linux 32-bit Applications. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of kernel flaws. In particular, in a previous video, we talked a little bit about kernel flaws and how they can exist. And I want to talk about 32-bit system calls. We talked about 64-bit system calls in our previous video, which I know was a little strange given that this is a 32-bit course. But I wanted to show you that first because it's slightly simpler. So let me go ahead and bring up our code from last time. So here's what we had. We had system call one, which was a write call and we passed it some parameters. And then we had system call 60, which was exit. If I want to do the same thing in 32 bit Linux, it starts out very similar. I have a global section called start. Rather, I have a global label called start and a section called text. And I will call the write system call. Now notice this is now system call four. So this is not the same with 32-bit and 64-bit Linux. Why aren't they the same? I don't know. They're just not. The other thing that you'll notice before we had a bunch of R registers and we said that was the really expanded register, if you will, I expanded out to 64-bit and here we're back to the E registers and here it's a little simpler in a sense because everything starts with E and then we have A system call number B first parameter C second parameter D third parameter. So this is our calling convention. And now, whereas in the 64 bit case, I would call syscall which was a CPU function. Here I do an interrupt number hex eight zero that says, please perform a system call. Then when I go to exit and return my zero as before, I move one, which is the system call for exit in 32 bit Linux into EA, I XOR EBX so that I can put a zero in there without having a null in my value. And then I make another system call using an int hex eight zero. All of this is the same. So let me go ahead and build that. So once again, I'm going to run NASM and my output format will be ELF in this case before it was ELF 64 and my output file will be uh, simple 32.0 and my input will be simple 32.asm. That's done. I link it. I link simple 32.0 and my output will just be simple 32. All right. Now in this case, the linker is unhappy. So before NASM was unhappy and now the linker is unhappy because I'm trying to make a 32 bit executable and it wants to default to 64 bit. So I of course can do the standard Linux thing to check this LD dash dash help. 
and I want to say how can I change my architecture so now I've compiled it I need to link it so to link it for 32-bit Linux LD I need to give it dash M and I need to give it elf underscore I386 I believe is correct and then I will give it my input simple 32.0 and my output will be simple 32 seems to have taken it and now I can run simple 32 and it says hello Pentester Academy great so this is just a quick introduction to show you what you could expect if you have a Linux executable that is using system calls how are they done and all that okay so I showed you a couple of simple assembly language programs but well, that's not what you're working with is it all right you're going to be working with an executable and you might say how do I know what system calls it's making and we'll talk more about this in the part of this class where we would talk about reverse engineering malware but a very simple way is to use s trace so if I use s trace on my application I see that I am making a couple of system calls except VE I'm calling my program and then s trace here's the process and it makes a call to write that's a system call right there and a system call to exit I can do the same thing with my 64-bit app and notice that it also calls the same functions okay so what some things to note here when it comes to a system call not using the stack and we talked a lot about stack buffer overflows in this course that's sort of the staple flaw for reverse engineers that are trying to find vulnerabilities so Linux systems are a little bit less vulnerable than Windows systems in part because all of these API calls when I'm calling into the operating system are not being done by a regular function calls so I'm not putting a bunch of stuff on the stack and then calling the function instead I'm making a system call in the system call numbers are put mostly into the registers and then a system call is executed and we saw that that's a little bit different for 64-bit versions of Linux versus 32-bit so that is a big change however this in a sense does make it easier to find system calls it's easier to see these over say a regular function call and of course if you look in a debugger you're going to see something a little bit different so why do I want to find these flaws again if I have a flaw in the kernel then this is probably going to give me some sort of privileged execution and I can do bad things with my shellcode and such 
it's pretty easy to find these system calls. So if I know that a certain kernel version has a flaw, and let's say it's right. So if I have a flaw in the right process, I can say, you know what? I'm going to find programs that have a call to this and see if I can exploit them somehow. So that is how I can exploit a Linux kernel flaw. First, I have to find it, and then I can try to find a way to exploit programs that are using a particular system call. All right, and that brings us to the close of our discussion on kernel flaws with Linux. I hope you've been enjoying this course so far. As a reminder, this course is one in a whole family of courses that we have here at Penn Tester Academy, your source for all things InfoSec. And I look forward to seeing you in this course or another course soon. See you then.